Welcome. Today is Wednesday, February 21st, 2018, and this is the NERI Early Career Researcher Forum. This forum is intended to foster the exchange of ideas and be a platform of best practices for successful research. It is intended to highlight compelling research, build up the natural hazards engineering student community, and provide presentation opportunities. For more information, visit the NERI website at designsafe-ci.org, where you can find links to the Sim Center and the NERI Learning Center. Today's webinar is coordinated by the Natural Hazards Engineering Research Infrastructures Computational Modeling and Simulation Center. This webinar is supported by the National Science Foundation under awards 1612843 and 152 0817. Any statements in this webinar are those of the presenter and do not necessarily represent the views of the National Science Foundation. Today's presentation is by Nikos Kaligiris. He is a postdoctoral scholar in civil engineering at UCLA. His primary research interests lie in nearshore hydrodynamics during extreme events such as tsunamis and hurricanes. His analysis combines numerical modeling, laboratory experiments, and field observations. Dr. Caligiris has been a member of several reconnaissance field surveys for tsunamis around the world. And the title of his presentation is Tsunami-Induced Turbulent Coherent Structures, Large-Scale Experimental Observations and, Interpre and Interpretations. And Nikos, I invite you to begin. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Matt. Yeah. And also thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to present my research on this forum. So uh, my, my talk today, as you mentioned, is on tsunami-induced turbulent coherent structures. And uh, turbulent coherent structures is the scientific term for um, eddies that have been observed to form in the near shore uh, during tsunamis. Uh, my talk today um, will talk uh, during my PhD when I was at the University of Southern California. I participated in an NSF funded project where we studied the generation and evolution um, of a tsunami induced uh, turbulent coherent structure. And um, in today's presentation, we talk about the findings from these laboratory experiments and also about. Um, their value for harbor applications uh, in tsunami prone areas. So this here is a quick breakdown of uh, my presentation today. I will first give a brief introduction on tsunamis and more specifically on tsunami induced currents. Uh, then I will briefly talk about uh, what we know about uh, tsunami induced turbulent coherent structures, both uh, from observations we've seen in the field and also from the, from the literature. And then in the main part of my presentation, I will talk about the lab experiments that we conducted, how we collected the, the experimental data, and also the interpretation of our findings. And at the end, I will, um, I will talk about the value of the experimental results and how to extend this work that we did in, in the future. So, real quick, uh, tsunamis are geophysical scale waves that are predominantly, predominantly generated by submarine earthquakes. If the earthquake is big enough, the, um, the co-seismic seafloor deformation will set a set of waves, and these waves can reach wavelengths from tens to hundreds of kilometers. And due to their very long wavelength, they can uh, travel uh, vast distances, even across oceans. Uh, in the deep water, they have a very small amplitude, but as they approach the, the shore, they grow in amplitude and they have the potential to, to flood vast areas. Past research um, has um, primarily focused on um, on flooding for the obvious reason of saving lives and, and property in, in coastal areas. Um, the, um, uh, there has been um, analytical, uh, analytical methods and numerical models have been, have been developed uh, 
to predict coastal flooding. Uh, the numerical models typically employ the nonlinear shallow water equations, which uh, capture the important physics at a low, relatively low computational cost. Given accurate uh, initial conditions, it has been shown time and time again that um, these um, standard models used for tsunami modeling can accurate, accurately reproduce uh, propagation across an ocean and, uh, as seen on the last plot, but also um, predict coastal flooding in, in coastal areas, like an example shown on the right. So um, tsunami research uh, has advanced to the point that we are now able to do um, accurate uh, forecasts um, for tsunami induced flooding, even in, in real time. But um, when it comes to tsunami induced, uh, while tsunami induced flooding is fairly well understood, when it comes to tsunami induced currents, uh, things start to become a little bit trickier. These uh, two figures here show uh, on the left uh, the maximum uh, tsunami amplitude in Crescent City, California, during the 2011 Japan tsunami. And on the right, you can see the corresponding maximum, maximum current speed at the same harbor and the same tsunami event. It is immediately apparent from these two plots that um, maximum currents are much more localized as compared to to the to tsunami amplitudes. Um, high currents can be seen around the, the port structures uh, where they reach up to 12 knots, but in the rest of the domain, they are relatively, the current speed is relatively low. In this animation here, which is also for Crescent City and the same uh, tsunami event, we'll show you what is happening during the tsunami. As you can see, while the uh, tsunami currents approach the near shore, they sort of bend around the coastal structures and they accelerate. Uh, it is this interaction of the currents with the shoreline that creates the highly, highly localized current field that we saw in the previous transparency. Flow separation and strong horizontal shearing near the port structures also, also introduces vorticity, and this uh, vorticity in turn uh, generates eddies. So if the conditions are favorable or uh, unfavorable, if you may, these eddies may grow in very large uh, sizes and can even occupy the whole harbor or port base. Uh, one such eddy was spotted in Port Oari during the 2011 Japan tsunami. Port Oari is located south of the Fukushima power plant um, where the nuclear disaster happened right after the 2011 earthquake. In this footage, uh, which was taken from a helicopter, a gigantic eddy with a diameter much, much larger than the local water depth can be seen spinning in, inside the harbor for tens of minutes until it was washed away by the next in incoming wave. These large eddies come with high rotational uh, uh, flow speeds that can exert forces in port structures, but also move a lot of sediment around in the port. They are also notorious for uh, dragging ships uh, um, inside these eddies, and they can be carried along with them. One of the uh, best known examples of a ship caught inside um, a tsunami-induced edit took place in Port Salala of Oman during the 2004 Indonesian tsunami. Scientists uh, went to, to Oman, and specifically in Port Salala, to take quantitative measurements nine months approximately after the, the tsunami. It is a standard practice to interview eyewitnesses in those uh, reconnaissance um, missions and ask uh, information about uh, the tsunami. So in this case, in Port Salala, the harbor master uh, described how um, an hour and a half after the arrival of the tsunami, um, this 285-meter uh, container ship by the name Mersk Mandraki was caught inside the tsunami-induced eddy and broke its moorings. It started spinning out of control 
um, and any attempts to free the, the ship from the Edis was with via tugboats was was left in vain. So the ship was dragged offshore. It almost hit the breakwater and eventually got um, beached in a nearby sandbar. This uh, sketch here was approximately drawn by the harbor master who described um, the event. Likely the ship didn't collide with any other ship, but you can imagine uh, many uh, worse scenarios of having a ship inside a, a port out of control. At the time, this was a mysterious phenomenon when this was recorded, and <clears throat> my advisor, Kostas Yonlegis, attributed this to harbor resonance. But now we know that this was not harbor resonance, but it, it was one of those turbulent and coherent structures that form during a tsunami um, where the, the flow separates around a sharp corner like, the, like this one here, seen here. So, <clears throat> apart from observational reports, there is not much that we know <laughs> about tsunami-induced eddies, because fundamental research into the generation and evolution of those tsunami-induced eddies is practically non-existent. For research into eddies in, in the context of nearshore processes, like the ones discussed here, we have to go to literature in the hydraulics community, and specifically studies in shallow flows. So shallow or 2D flows um, uh, exhibit weak uh, vertical variability, uh, similar to what we coastal engineers uh, call shallow water waves, where the, the, the length of the wave is much longer than the local water depth. So when these eddies that we study grow in lengths that are much larger than the local water depth, they are called turbulent coherent structures. Uh, the exact definition, definition of which is given here. Um, <clears throat> from this point on, um, uh, excuse me for the confusion, I will use uh, the term turbulent material structure, eddy, and vortex interchangeably, but they all mean, uh, all these terms mean the same thing. So, uh, from what we know in the literature, the predominant um, generation mechanism for these uh, turbulent material structures is topographic forcing. Uh, as seen in the figure here, <coughs> um, it uh, topographic forcing um, exerts transverse shear, and which eventually leads to um, flow separation on the lee side and the generation of an eddy. Um, <coughs> this is not uh, tsunami-induced turbulent coherent structures are not the only types of geophysical scale turbulent coherent structures that we know. Uh, one example uh, of another known case is shown here, and it, it has a name of tidal flashing. So, um, when the uh, tidal induced currents in a tidal inlet are very strong uh, during ebb tide, the, the currents at the tip at the inlet mouth may separate and form this sort of dipole that can self propel itself to the offshore. There has been significant research where they've studied under what conditions these dipoles form and under what conditions um, they separate from the inlet mouth and migrate offshore. Uh, these sort of dipoles have important implications for nutrient, nutrient exchange between the estuary and the offshore. Uh, other types of uh, geophysical scale and uh, turbulent coherent structures that we know are shown here. On the left, you can see a mesoscale eddy forming uh, east of uh, Tasmania. And these mesoscale um, um, turbulent coherent structures are very important because they exhibit uh, different properties than the surrounding uh, ocean. Um, they, uh, because they can carry uh, heat, um, carbon, and uh, also oxygen, and sorry, salt, and they can travel very vast distances. And so it has been um, studied thoroughly. And other geophysical scale um, um, turbulent heat structures that we know uh, also exist in the atmosphere, not only in the oceans. Uh, for example, hurricanes um, are some um, a type of turbulent structure that exhibits uh, similar properties. 
like the one shown here, uh, the atmosphere is uh, like the ocean is limited in in terms of uh, depth. So this type of um, of vortex can also be considered as uh, a shallow. Even though <coughs> these uh, um, turbulent cohere structures are in a different scale, and because they are in a different scale, Coriolis force starts to become important. Uh, there is still a lot of um, information that we can extract from the research that has been done on these vortices. So <clears throat> since fundamental research uh, is absent uh, for tsunami-induced turbulent material structures, we set up a simplified uh, experiment in uh, Oregon State University's uh, tsunami basin, where we recreated the generation of a turbulent material structure using appropriate scaling as seen in the videos here. We collected all the data necessary to study both the generation and evolution of those turbulent coherent structures in a well-controlled environment. The, um, the results and the analysis uh, can be meaningfully translated to the prototype scale for harbor applications. So Oregon State University's wave basin is one of the largest in the world and it has a 44, it's 44 meters long and it's 26 and a half meters wide. It has a piston type wave maker on the left side and vertical walls on the other three sides. We built an impermeable breakwater along the width of the basin, leaving a three meter gap between the breakwater tip and the sidewall. And in this way, we created a simplified image of a port. Um, I have put the label of the offshore basin on the left side, since this is the side of the wave maker. But based on this geometry, the port side can be either of them, either left or right. The boundary conditions that uh, created a stable turbulent coherent structure is shown in the, the inset figure. It consists of a slow push forward of the wave maker and a sudden retreat. Uh, which created an asymmetric N wave. In terms of the, of the chosen water depth, it translates to an experimental scale of approximately one in 27. And uh, the, 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 the experimental wave period and wave amplitude both translate to very realistic prototype scales. And this is one of the um, rare cases where both the time and the, le the length vectors are left relatively undistorted in this experiment. In terms of the dimensionless, the important dimensionless numbers, uh, it can be concluded that the laboratory results are scale independent for small scale geophysical flows like the ones that we are interested in. Uh, the experiment can be broken down in three phases. In the, in the first phase, the wave maker pushes forward and it also pushes um, the water from the left basin towards the right basin, creating a left to right current in the, in the harbor channel. And this creates um, a turbulent coherent structure on the right side of the breakwater tip. As the wave maker suddenly retreats, it creates, it changes the direction inside the, uh, inside the harbor channel, and now it's from, from right to left. And this current is further enforced by the reflection of the leading elevation wave of the right wall. So this, uh, in the beginning, um, generates a starting jet that um, forms into um, a vortex. And this vortex eventually detaches from the starting jet and starts evolving as a free vortex in the offshore basin. And this constitutes the third and final phase of the experiment. Four overhead cameras were used to visually capture the, the water surface. And surface tracers were introduced in the flow to extract uh, surface velocities through a technique called particle tracking velocimetry, or PDV in short. It is a non-invasive technique to extract um, 
surface velocities over uh, big areas. We repeated the same experiment many, many times to examine both the repeatability of the experiment, but also to collectively obtain a satisfactory density of data. Uh, this rectified video <coughs> uh, shows one of the PDV experiments as recorded by the four overhead cameras. I had to speed up the video for this uh, presentation. So you can see how the, the, the water pushes the, the water to the right side, creating initial TCS. And then as the flow reverses, the, the, the starting jet evolves into uh, a vortex that starts evolving freely after it's detached from the trailing jet in the offshore basin. And you can see that the, uh, the tracers accumulate at the, at the vortex center in what is known as a flow convergence zone near the, the center. And we had to keep supplying the flow with, with tracers to extract velocities from this area. The, the vortex um, eventually um, occupied the whole offshore basin and circulation was still visible inside the, the wave basin even one hour after the experiments. So in order to the, the, the methodology to extract um, surface velocities from this type of videos consists of four basic steps. The first step is to detect the center of those tracers. And the second step is to track them in time. Then you have to convert the, uh, the, the image uh, coordinates to world coordinates and then extract surface velocity vectors in physical units. This <coughs> animation here corresponds to the rectified video I showed, I showed you before. Each of these velocity vectors corresponds to one of the tracers that was tracked in the flow. Velocities uh, in the basin reached um, one meter and a half meters per second, which can be translated to a prototype 15 knots, which is very high speeds in these types of flows that we are studying. The, the methodology and implementation of uh, particle tracking velocimetry was validated through measurements of ADV instruments um, that were positioned in, two, in the location shown in the figure here. ADV stands for Acoustic Doppler, Doppler Velocimetry. And these are instruments that measure the, the velocity in all three directions, X and Y. And as you can see, the, the black here, the black curves in those top plots correspond to the ADV measurements, and the red corresponds to the PDV extracted velocity. So as you can see from these plots that they compare well, the velocity extraction was uh, done carefully. Now, <coughs> uh, there, we also used a stereo camera configuration for the area around the, the breakwater tip in order to extract uh, velocity vectors in more detail. Uh, what this uh, stereo camera configuration allows is to extract velocities and, and the location of the traces in all three directions in what is known as uh, stereo or 3D PDV. Um, stereo 3D PDV requires an additional step compared to 2D PDV, which is the stereoscopic uh, particle matching between the tracers uh, tracked with one camera um, to, to match them with the, the tracers captured with the, with the other camera. So since we can extract um, surface elevation through 3D PDV, I could compare uh, my results using the wave gauges that were laid out in the, in, the, in the wave basin, the location of which is shown with uh, red crosses in this figure here. Black again is the, uh, the measurements, this time of the wave gauges, and red is the, the 3D PDV extracted surface elevation. As you can see, the, the implementation of the 3D PDV worked uh, really great in this, in this example here. In terms of the tools I used for the 2D and 3D PDV are shown here. For the camera intrinsic parameterization, which has to do with the 
uh, distortion introduced by the length by the lens of the camera. I use the camera calibration toolbox developed by uh, Dr. Bouillet of Caltech, and you can download this uh, toolbox through this link. And in terms of the camera extrinsic uh, parameters, which has to do with the image to world coordinate transformation, I use the direct linear transformation equations, and I'm providing here a reference uh, to implement these, uh, these equations. And last, in terms of the particle identification and particle tracking, I used the methodology of Crocker and Greer, and more specifically, the implementation uh, through the MATLAB toolbox at the link provided here. For 3D PDV, um, I had to develop my own uh, PDV toolbox, which is based on the work by Capard and Tal. And the difference here is that uh, for my 3D PDV experiments, the interparticle spacing was smaller compared to the, the flow speed. So this made it more complicated for conventional PTV algorithms to, to follow the, the tracers. So uh, we needed an extra matching uh, criteria. And the work by Capard et al. uses the, the topology of the neighboring uh, tracers um, through uh, Voronoi five stars. Uh, which uh, worked really great in the, in the application I wanted to use it for. Uh, in terms of the scleroscoping particle matching, uh, again, I developed my own toolbox, which is based on the work by Duchamp uh, and others, 2005. I, <clears throat> even though I have developed uh, my own toolbox, I haven't released those yet. I'm planning to do so in the near future in case uh, this can be useful for the research of others. Also, if uh, anyone from the audience wants to know more about the, this implementation, I can provide more details at the end of my presentation. <clears throat> now, after I went through the, uh, the data, uh, the, the methodology of collecting data, I will now move into the analysis and I will start from the second phase of the experiments where the offshore TCS is being generated. Now for this, um, uh, for, uh, for this application, uh, I overlaid all the scattered uh, velocity vectors from 2D and 3D PDV, and I averaged them on a regular grid, like, uh, like seen in this animation. And by obtaining the mean velocity field on a, on a regular grid, I was able to calculate the spatial derivatives and obtain important metrics that, de that describe the flow. One of those important metrics is swirl strength. Uh, swirl strength is a, um, a metric that describes the local rotation of the fluid, similar to vorticity. Uh, maps of swirl strength shown here were used to track the location and the spatial extent of the starting jet vortex and eventually the, uh, the turbulent coherent structure. Uh, the zero swirl strength contour, uh, shown with the green polygons, denoted the boundary of the starting jet and eventually the vortex. What I was interested in this stage was to see how the, um, how the starting jet and the vortex uh, grow um, how quickly it grows and how it scales. So in other words, I had to um, find a dimensional number that will uh, make the data uh, to collapse on a straight line. And if you find this dimensional number, then you can translate this to prototype scales. And I was inspired by experiments done in vortex rings. And I found this dimensionless number, which gave me the right scaling as shown, as shown here. The other thing that I was interested in this experimental stage was to see uh, at what time the, uh, the vortex separates from the trailing jet that keeps applying it with kinetic energy. So this time step corresponds to this, uh, uh, to this time shown here. <clears throat> 
where the the vortex has detached from the from the trailing jet. This can also be shown through a plot that shows the growth of circulation, and circulation denoted with capital gamma is a metric that uh, gives you the uh, the strength of the vortex, and you can see that it is at this time that the um, the vortex separates, which is also shown by the, this rapid decay of, of circulation. Again, uh, I had to find a dimensional number that will tell me uh, what are the important parameters in the flow uh, with which the, the vortex detachment time scales with, which can again be translated to the prototype scale um, for hardware applications. I believe that the, the most um, um, interesting physics happen after this uh, uh, vortex gets it out from the uh, trailing jet in what is the, the third experimental phase. Uh, for this experimental stage, uh, the first thing I had to do was um, find the path um, that the, the experimental turbulent here structure followed in the offshore basin. To achieve that, uh, I used two different methods to track the center of the, of the vortex. In the beginning, uh, where I had a nice distribution of tracers, I could compute vorticity maps, and through those vorticity maps, I could define my vortex center as the location of maximum vorticity. But at later uh, stages of this year's uh, development, uh, because of flow convergence and divergence near the vortex center, uh, in some instances I was left with very, very little traces to work with and compute uh, vorticity maps. So in these, in these cases, I used the, the tracer conglomerate in the vortex center and I <coughs> detected the boundary of this tracer conglomerate, conglomerate through image processing and the center of mass of these polygons define my vortex center. So after going through this tedious work of extracting the, the path of the TCS center, you can get a plot like this, which shows the, the path of the, the experimental vortices for all 22 experiments that we did. So seeing this plot, uh, I was, uh, I could see that repeatability is fairly, is fairly good because the, um, the vortices followed approximately the same, the same path. Even though um, this is a highly uh, turbulent flow, uh, which means that there is a lot of, um, there are many stochastic elements involved. And the second observation that it intrigued me by looking at this plot was that uh, the vortices in all the experiments uh, started to converge towards the same location uh, inside, the, in the, inside the offshore basin. So in, uh, in, this was uh, an observation that I had to explain, and I will get back uh, to as to why this happened in, in a few slides. Um, extracting the, the vortex center uh, allowed me to convert uh, all the uh, scattered um, velocity vectors from a, a Cartesian coordinate system to a TCS centered um, coordinate system. And I could compute the, um, the velocity vectors in the azimuthal, so along the arc of, of a circle, uh, the velocity in the azimuthal direction, also the radial, which is uh, away uh, or towards uh, the center of a circle. Uh, from the scattered velocity data, I could obtain the mean velocity profiles, which was a convenient representation of the flow field since my vortex was not perfectly, the experimental vortex was not perfectly axisymmetric. So through those uh, mean uh, velocity profiles, I could um, find out uh, with what rate the maximum azimuthal velocity decays with time. So by following the, the peaks of, the, of each um, mean velocity profile in time, you can draw 
uh, a decay curve like the one shown on the right. We know from, from the literature that the predominant uh, decay mechanism in shallow turbulent coherent structures is bottom friction. And we were looking for a simple analytical formula that can explain this decay. And we can, we can use this, uh, this analytical formulation also for, for hardware applications. And it would be great to have one to use. Um, a simple formula, formula can be derived by equating the angular momentum with the bottom friction, with the bottom friction force. And if you make the simplification that you have a perfectly azimuthal flow, so no velocity in the radial component, and also that the, the vortex doesn't grow very quickly in time in terms of the, the spatial growth in the radial direction, then this uh, force balance comes down into uh, a first order differential equation where you can compute the, the decay of maximum azimuthal velocity with time. If you plug in uh, the only free parameter, which is uh, the bottom shear stress, you can get the green curve, which is the prediction of the analytical decay and it perfectly matches the experimental decay, uh, which is great news because this is a very simple formula that we can use for hardware applications to see how quickly those turbulent coherent structures uh, decay in time. Um, as the, the turbulent coherent structure was um, slowing down, it was also growing uh, in size. Uh, by entraining more and more ambient fluid from its perimeter in what is called uh, viscous diffusion. The, the growth rate predicted by viscous diffusion is shown here with the blue dashed line. The, the measured vortex radius is shown with the black circles. And as you can see up to this point, it's following the theoretical prediction of viscous diffusion. But as you move further in time, you can see that the vortex radius starts to fluctuate and it stops following the theoretical prediction. Again, this was an intri intriguing finding, finding that I had to ex somehow explain. Uh, it occurred to me that it might have something to do with the vertical, uh, with the spatial confinement of the vortex in the offshore basin. So once you plot the the minimum distance to the vertical boundaries, you can notice that the, the vortex radius was confined but th by those uh, vertical boundaries, which was the side walls of the basin and, and the breakwater. Uh, in other words, the vortex, uh, the experimental vortex was constantly trying to find more space to grow. And uh, the reason why uh, all the, uh, the TCS centers ended up in the same location was because this location allowed it to grow to its maximum uh, size um, it could grow in for the, this particular geometry uh, that we tried in the, in the wave base. Uh, as a matter of fact, this, the, um, the turbulent behavior structure that was observed in port ORI also ended up approximately in the center of the, of the port basin. So again, this is an important observation that we can predict where, this, uh, where these uh, large eddies will end up at. And we can also uh, use viscous diffusion um, as an approximate um, um, method to predict the, the spatial growth of um, those um, turbulent coherent structures in the prototype scale. The last thing uh, I wanted to, uh, to do is characterize the turbulent coherent structure flow field. Um, so I went through the literature to try to find a vortex uh, profile that fits my observations. Uh, it can be shown that uh, in theory, any monopolar vortex will converge to the so-called stirring vortex. Uh, the stirring vortex has an idealized flow profile shown in this plot here, and it has a free parameter alpha that controls 
the stiffness of the velocity profile. The higher alpha is, the, the more unstable the vortex becomes. And by uh, unstable, I mean that uh, the single vortex can break down in a multipolar uh, vortex or break down in more individual vortices. It, the, the name of Stirling vortex is derived by the way it can be recreated in the laboratory. Uh, in the lab, you spin, um, you submerge uh, a cylinder inside your fluid, start spinning the fluid inside the, the, inside the cylinder, and then lift the cylinder and let the rotating fluid interact with the ambient fluid, and your uh, flow profile will start converging to this theoretical prediction. And certain profiles have, have been used, uh, obviously, in the literature to describe cyclonic vortices, like the recent hurricane Harvey. So with that in mind, uh, I started fitting my scatter experimental data to this theoretical stirring profile. And uh, you can see that this uh, free parameter alpha uh, is approximately 0 0.35 based on the experimental results. This is much lower than alpha equals 2 that has been found to fit the, the atmospheric vortices. Um, this theoretical profile has been uh, derived for. Using the uh, root mean square error as a goodness of fit parameter, I was able to determine that the, the scatter velocity data started to fit or converge towards this theoretical profile at around 400 seconds, which is uh, very meaningful be because this shows you that there is some time uh, after which we can use this theoretical profile to describe um, a tsunami-induced uh, turbulent coherence structure. The only question that remains is what happens before this key time here? Why um, didn't uh, the scattered velocity data um, follow this theoretical prediction at previous times? And the clue lies in the, the clue to answer this question lies in the radial uh, velocity component. In shallow flows, uh, the, the, the radial velocity and the vertical velocity components uh, are described as secondary flow components because they are much weaker compared to the azimuthal. But as you can see from the plots here, in earlier times, the radial velocity component was significant. And at around 400 seconds, it started to become insignificant. So in other words, the, um, the deviation from the perfect azimuthal uh, velocity profile was the reason why uh, the experimental vortex didn't uh, follow this theoretical stirring profile at earlier times. I was able, uh, by computing the ratio of the kinetic energy in the rail direction over the kinetic energy in the azimuthal direction, I was further able to demonstrate that at around 400 seconds, was what is called the transition to quasi two-dimensional flow. Uh, this has uh, important implications because uh, when it comes to, uh, to mixing and sediment transport, but also when it comes to the use of numerical models. Because the standard numerical models used for tsunami modeling are depth average, which means that uh, everything that happens in the water column is averaged out, it means that uh, in the beginning, while the, while the flow is highly three-dimensional, those models will not capture the physics accurately. But there is a time after which they will start um, reproducing the, the physics more, more accurately. So uh, in summary, uh, in the context of uh, near shore currents uh, induced by, by tsunamis. Uh, we studied, um, we, recreated the um, we recreated the generation and evolution of a tsunami induced current in the laboratory. And we, um, we collected uh, all the data necessary to, to study both its generation and evolution. And the the results that were yielded have uh, important implications for uh, um, applications for ports and harbors, where the timescales of development of TCS development can be applied for.
and the forces on, on port structures can be computed as well as the sediment transport potential. Um, the, the laboratory data can be further used to validate numerical models used for tsunami forecasting and if um, uh, better um, numerical models are are derived for um, forecasting means that uh, decision makers can uh, make uh, uh, can manage the ship evacuation during um, a tsunami more uh, efficiently. My last aspiration is that my research will have um, will have an effect on future uh, port and harbor design in in tsunami prone areas. Um, we are. Um, we are currently in the process of modeling the, the Oregon uh, experiments using a large eddy simulation model, which is a fully 3D model with very small, um, uh, with very high resolution. We are uh, testing different turbulence schemes, including the standard Smolgorisky and dynamic Lagrangian. And the results will be validated through the, through the, through the laboratory data. If, uh, if we have already um, made a lot of um, um, we have made a lot of progress already, and uh, the results are promising. And once we fully validate the methodology, we can uh, examine um, the three D flow structure of the flow and the turbulent properties of the flow as well. Um, also in the future, we, uh, using this implementation, we can test different boundary conditions and different geometries in the harbor. This is an ongoing collaboration that, uh, between uh, the University of Southern California and the University of, of Delaware. So while this study already yields very, um, very interesting results, there are still things that uh, can be improved. For example, I, because I only collected um, surface velocity information on the water surface, I couldn't examine the full 3D structure of the flow. Uh, also, I wasn't able to, um, to study the turbulent properties of the flow through in situ measurements. Hopefully, the uh, large, eddy simulation, uh, large eddy simulations will uh, offer insights in these two areas, but it would be uh, very good if uh, these can be studied also in the laboratory in the future. Uh, last, since I only studied one uh, boundary condition, one harbor configuration, uh, I wasn't able to fully examine under which conditions wave-induced TCS is formed, and uh, ex examine also how the uh, time transition to quasi two-dimensional scales with time. Uh, the last thing I want to show is a video um, captured in, in, in the lab. Uh, we put some model ships uh, at the tip of the breakwater to simulate how ships can be entrained in those turbulent coherent structures. Uh, just like the unfortunate ship uh, Merz Mandragi was captured in an eddy in Port Salala in Oman. You can see how uh, this video demonstrates how difficult it would be to control the ship under those uh, circumstances. Um, I would like to acknowledge all the sources of funding. And this project was funded by an NICE NSF grant awarded to my advisor, Professor Lainet. And I was also supported by two fellowships at USC. Um, as I said, uh, it was uh, Professor Lainet's project and I was very fortunate to be involved in. And I would also like to thank my colleagues, Aykut Aicha and Adam Ryan for their uh, for the help during the, the experiments. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you, Nikos, very much for the presentation. Um, at this time, we'll start the question and answer session. Uh, attendees are reminded uh, that questions should be re uh, submitted through the chat panel uh, and directed to the moderator. And Nikos, the, the first question uh, starts out with a comment, which is a great discussion of a very interesting topic. How could the insights provided by the research be useful to emergency managers to improve ship evacuation before, uh, before tsunamis? 
And uh, what would your takeaway advice be to harbor masters and emergency planners in coastal areas? Okay, so um, the first question was how this can be used for um, ship This information can be used for ship evaluation. So um, what we, um, what this research, this fundamental research does was, uh, is to to, uh, to show the first order problem. So we have a very simplified geometry that doesn't necessarily correspond to any harbor geometry that you can find out in the field in the prototype scale. Uh, but it shows um, what the important physics are in the flow. So uh, once we figure this out, then we can improve uh, the numerical models to capture the right physics. So th if we improve the numerical models, then we can improve the forecast, right? Um, and by improving the, the forecast, then um, emergency managers, managers can make better decisions of uh, which parts of the of the port have to be first evaluated, um, but the, there's an also there's another takeaway message that um, whatever, uh, which is a very simple one, that wherever you have very sharp corners inside the harbor, then you can expect those eddies uh, eddies to form. Right, uh, this is very simple, and if uh, if the conditions are, are favorable then you can use um, some of those uh, simplifying, uh, simplified analytical equations that came out of my research to, uh, to predict uh, how quickly those uh, edits will, will grow in size, um, uh, what the flow structure looks like in terms of the velocity profile. Um, so you can, use, uh, you can derive some simple models to, um, to calculate both forces on structures, what the sediment transport potential is, et cetera. Okay, well, thank you. Um, are there any field measurements of tsunami-induced eddies that would help uh, collaborate this or corroborate this research? Um, we don't have um, quantitative measurements per se of those uh, eddies. Um, there are some, um, there are very limited uh, data out there in the, in the literature that measure uh, tsunami induced currents in general. Uh, we published a, a paper in 2016 um, where we measured um, in GRL, where we measured um, tsunami induced currents in a harbor in Southern California, in Ventura, during the 2015 Chilean tsunami. But uh, the measurements that we took uh, mostly corresponded to the starting jet uh, and not uh, in a fully developed eddy like the one I studied in, in my experiment. Um, now, as, as part of my postdoc at, at UCLA, we are laying out a methodology uh, to be ready to, to deploy instrumentation uh, in a future tsunami where we can capture the flow field of a fully developed uh, TCS. We don't know if we're ever going to be successful in such an attempt, but we will try. Okay. Um, another question is, can you remind me how the radius of vortex was estimated? Uh, okay, so the, the radius of the vortex, um, I haven't included this. It was extracted for, from vorticity maps. So I was setting a threshold to maximum vorticity. So at, at each time I had a maximum vorticity that corresponded to the center of the vortex. If you, you can define your vortex boundary as for example, 10% of the maximum vorticity at each time. And this contour of 10% of maximum vorticity defines your vortex boundary. That is how I define it in my study. Okay. And that's how those black uh, points were Extracted. And I think uh, we have time for one more question, and it is, from your experience working at OSU's Wave Basin, what suggestions do you have for those starting their PhDs who plan on conducting experimental research in fluid mechanics? Um, the, the most important uh, aspect when it comes to experiments in, in fluid mechanics uh, is the, the experimental scaling. So if you don't get the experimental scaling correctly, 
your your results are meaningless and they cannot be meaningfully extrapolated in, in the full scale. So uh, that's the, the most important uh, message. Uh, when, uh, another um, couple of tips is that uh, it was always uh, important to do some quality uh, assessment uh, of the data as you, as you collect them. For example, each day or each week, make sure that your data is good and not go back home without anything to, meaningful to, to work with. And that um, also from my research, I found out that um, um, there is always um, room to, to develop your, um, your own ideas when it comes to data collection. Uh, it's always good to, to read the literature and what the uh, tools are already available out there, but don't be afraid to, to develop your own uh, that suit your application better. Okay. Well, uh, with that, uh, we're at the conclusion of today's Early Career Researcher Forum. On behalf of the attendees, thank you, Nikos, for taking the time to share your research. Uh, to the attendees, thank you for your participation and questions. Please check the Sim Center's website at simcenter.designsafe-ci.org and check your inbox for emails from announce at designsafe-ci that will uh, have registration links for additional upcoming webinars in the Early Career Researcher Forum and the Natural Hazards Engineering 101 webinar series. Thank you for attending today's forum.